Awesome. This past week in Kenya, multiple people saved. So it's been a great week. Just a great week of sharing the gospel. Today, we're going to talk about rest. Last week or two weeks ago when I spoke, we talked about the power of the gospel. We know the power of the gospel. Uh, if you look at Romans 1.16, let's, uh, let's look at that real quick. Quick review here, Romans 1.16. For I'm not ashamed of the power of the gospel, it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. True power. You want to change a person's trajectory, change their path, eternal destiny. You know, a person is going to hell because they've not believed. We're, that is very clear, John 3, 16 through 18. And ultimately, he's on, a, he's on a highway to hell. And to change that trajectory, to change that path, it is the gospel. Not anything else, not going to confessional, not getting water baptized, not any kind of religious performance system will change that eternal destiny. It is the gospel. If you turn over to Colossians 1.13. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Translated, changed position. You were ultimately heading ultimately to the eternal darkness with Satan, and that's it. And because of the power of the gospel, we know that in context through verses 10 through 14, it talks about the gospel there, that ultimately when a person believes, you're translated to that kingdom of darkness under the kingdom of his son, changing that eternal destiny by one-time faith in Christ alone. Turn over to 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 1. Again, this is the power of the gospel. 2 Timothy chapter 1, again, starting there in verse 8, Be thou therefore not ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, not ashamed of the gospel, nor of me, his prisoner, but thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Again, able to change that eternal destiny, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his purpose and his grace was given us Christ Jesus before the world began. There's the gospel. It's everlasting. It was before the world was created out late 10, but is now made manifest revealed to us appearing by our savior, Jesus Christ, who had abolished death. Again, not going to confirmation, not going to confessional. It is Christ that abolishes death. That second death that separates us in revelation chapter 20, that eternal separation from heaven and hath brought life and immortality and brought and ultimately, immortality to light through the gospel. 11, under which I am appointed a preacher and apostle and teacher of the Gentiles. 12, for which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. And I know whom I have believed. And I'm persuaded that he's able to keep that which I'm committed unto him against that day. And that is awesome. That's the power of the gospel. That's what we talked about last week. Or two weeks ago, Brian's message last week was on peace. This week we're going to talk about rest, the gospel rest. So we know the power of the gospel, the gospel power. Today we're going to talk about rest. And we're going to look at a group of people that did not find rest in the gospel. If I was asked you a question, how would you define rest? Anybody of you, how would you define rest? In your mind, or you can blurt it out right now, whatever you think, but how would you define rest? A peaceful mind. So ultimately, a what? Taking a nap. Taking a nap. <laughs> a labor of rest. And ultimately, a peace of the mind. So you have a, a peace of the soul, a peace of the body, a labor of rest. And ultimately, I looked up a dictionary, 1828. It says this. A cessation. A cessation of motion or action of any kind and, appli and applicable to any body or being. A rest from labor. A rest from labor. Rest from mental exertion. Rest of body or mind. Just what these two ladies have said. The body is at rest when it comes to move. The mind is at rest when it ceases to be disturbed or agitated. It's quiet. Repose. A state free from motion or disturbance. A state of reconciliation to God. And I guess what would that look like? We had somebody say take a nap. I remember my grandpa up in work walk into the house and there was two chairs 
Grandma had like a, a you know a suede chair. Grandpa had a leather chair, black leather chair. My grandpa smoked cigarettes and he had peanuts and he always a white t-shirt holes in it. But I remember my grandma would go bowling, and my grandpa would be there. And for me, rest. I was thinking about this, is that I could crawl up into his lap, and I was totally dependent on him. He holding me. I fall asleep. And ultimately that rest that I would have in him. And I was safe and secure in my grandpa's arms. And I was, there's pictures of me actually in his arms. And I could see that as now, right now. There's a rest that I have in Christ. So I like the definition that's given. A cessation of motion or action of any kind. And applicable to any body or being. Rest from labor. Rest from mental exertion. A rest of body or mind, a body at rest when it ceases to move, the mind is at rest when it ceases to be disturbed or agitated. Peace, like Brian talked about last week. My next question would then be, is there anything in this life that man has that offers rest? A labor rest, a mental rest? And I truly think thought last night really hard and I'm like I can think of nothing that man offers especially related to performance related religions because the rest offered and based on your performance is based on a person's opinion or your performance and to me there is no rest based in my performance ever religious performance systems never offer a rest however they are deceitful and plant seeds in individuals minds for example, they say, you're close, just a little more. And when a person dies, then everyone says, oh, they're in heaven. And I say, what a deceitful lie. In these thoughts, they keep individuals coming back to religious performance systems, which is a false message. Religious performance systems will never offer peace. They will never offer rest. And we're going to look at an example. Let's turn over to Hebrews chapter 3. you have your Bible we're going to look at a group of people the writer of Hebrews here talks about he's going to compare a group of people he's going to compare people that Moses delivered out of the wilderness ultimately delivered out of Egypt but they were wandered for 40 years and if you're wandering you probably don't have a rest. You probably don't get to take naps. You're probably just constantly in motion and your mind is probably constantly agitated. We know that group of people was constantly agitated, but we'll see why. We'll see why. But let's read chapter 3 and 4 here and we'll see why they did not ha not have rest. We'll find that because I love the Bible. It is so good. It is so good. And we'll just take our time reading through here and we'll see. Verse 1. And it's interesting with the King James. I got a 1968 Schofield that went online. I can't, you cannot buy these anymore, but it's authorized King James. And I went and bought four of them just in case I wear one out. I wanted to have extra. My wife's like, why? You know, she sends me to the store to buy beans. Can you go buy two cans of beans and come home with 20? I go, you never know. They might be out next time I go. So we have a pantry downstairs. So when I buy one, I buy five or six. So she doesn't send me to the store no more. Learn that lesson young, James. <laughs> so you know what? Because it, it uses words like the apostle here, and it's a capital A. It's important to understand things like that. But anyways, he goes, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. These people are partakers of it. They know they have it. Consider the apostle, capital A, not little a, like Paul or John or James. But here he is, the, the apostle. The one that gives the gospel. And high priest, capital H and P, of our profession, Christ Jesus. So speaking to believers here, obviously they have, they're partakers of the calling, the partakers of the gospel of Christ. He is the capital A. He's the one that declares the gospel. He is the high priest. He is the one that took the cross and turned it into an altar and offered up the Lamb of God. He offered up a perfect sacrifice because he is God. And ultimately, that is the profession of our faith. And that is the object of our faith. It is Christ Jesus. So whoever the writer here, maybe Paul, but ultimately whoever the writer of Hebrews, laying that foundation ultimately of what we're going to be talking about. Verse 2. 
Who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house? For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who hath built the house hath more honor than the house. And we know who, the, who built the house. It's Jesus Christ. Man tears down living things and they build buildings all around and put a cross on it. And they call it a church. But we know the church. We know the church is the body of Christ. It's Colossians 1.18. And ultimately, Jesus Christ takes dead things and he turns them into a living thing, the body of Christ. We're baptized into his body by the Holy Spirit, all by faith in Christ. Verse 4, For every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. We know here, it's a recap of back in chapter 1 here of Hebrews 1.10. It says, And thou, Lord, in the beginning has laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. We know that the heavens declare his glory. We can wake up. Every morning we see a picture of his sunrise. Every night a picture of his sunset given to us. And never everyone is always a little bit different. But ultimately, this is his hands. And the church, the body of Christ, is something that he has built by his hands. Verse 5. And Moses verily was faithful in all his health as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken of after and again, every, everything in the Bible is a picture of Christ. And I believe Moses, and we're going to talk about Joshua, they're all types of Christ. We know Christ is the antitype. He's the one, the one that fulfills that prophecy. He becomes the, the antitype of that. But Moses is a picture of Christ. Moses, we know that Satan there wanted to kill all the baby boys there, the Egyptians there. They, were, they know the nation Israel was getting too powerful and they were outnumbering the Egyptians. So the Pharaoh says, you know what? They went all to the midwives, the, 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 the nation Israel midwives. And he says, if you see a boy there, kill that boy at birth. And we know Jochebed and uh, um, his mom and uh, Moses' his dad took the baby boy there and put him ultimately in a little ark and put him out in the river there. And Moses, Moses our Pharaoh's daughter, took him raised in the Pharaoh's home. And ultimately, that boy there, when he got old, he went back and he killed actually two Egyptians and he tried to lead the nation Israel right then and there. But they rejected him. And he left. Kind of reminds me of Christ today. The nation Israel rejected the Messiah the first time. But the second time, Moses came back and he led the nation Israel out of Egypt. The second time, when Jesus Christ comes back, the nit he, ultimately, the nation of Israel, will accept him. So again, all these things are types of Christ. Verse 6, But Christ, as a son over his own house, whose house are we if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope, firm unto the end. So we're partakers of this heavenly calling. We are saved. And I say, let us be preserved in faith during suffering. Because if you look at these, if you look at verse 8 to 18, for it says, For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he's able to help them that are tempted. We know chapter 2 and part of chapter 4 there, it's all about when we have trials and temptations, sometimes we give up our peace. Sometimes we give up our rest. We have our, full, our eyes focused on the temporal things of this world and not the eternal things of this world. And ultimately, that kind of gives us stress at times in our life. It takes our peace away. We give our peace away. We give our rest away. And ultimately, we're here. We're to lay hold of that. Have confidence. Rejoice in the hope. The hope of Christ. Ultimately, until the end. Have confidence in that. And ultimately, like Jack said in, in Psalm 105 there, use those action verbs there. Seek Him. Glorify Him. Commune with Him. Pray to him, seek his face every single day. So when a person trusts in Christ alone for salvation, there is a cessation of labor, a stopping of labor and mental anguish. The work is done and all believers have a labor of rest. We settle and then get comfortable in the finished redemptive work of Christ. When a person goes through trials and tribs in this world, let us rejoice in the hope. Let us hold fast the confidence we have with Christ. Rejoice in the hope, hold fast with confidence to the end because that will give a person that mental rest. Because the work's been done. We're a purchased possession. We're guaranteed an inheritance into heaven. Preserve ourselves in his faithfulness during times of suffering and amidst trials in your life. We see verse 7 there, Hebrews. Wherefore, as the Holy Spirit saith, today if you hear 
his voice. Made me think about the Bible. Because all the men written over 1,500 years were ultimately these men were inspired by the Holy Spirit and we hear his voice. Verse 8. Here's the message. We're going to get into the meat of it here. And it says, Harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of the trial of the wilderness. So the nation Israel, they provoked God to anger. Why did they provoke him to anger? You're going to find out here. But ultimately, we as believers can be like, you know what? Let's harden not our hearts. One, if you're not saved, harden not your heart. And ultimately to the gospel of Christ. But as a child of God, let's not be have a hardened heart and provoke our dad to anger with us. When your father's here, and he's ultimately, we, we, we going to speak to the nation Israel. When your fathers put me to the test, they proved me and they saw my works for 40 years. Ultimately, whereof I was grieved with that generation and said, they do always err in their heart and they have not known my ways. And it is a heart condition. It is a heart condition. You know what? Ultimately, it's a condition that God knows if you believe or not. Are you going to find that rest and peace in Christ or not? We know a lot of people say they've trusted in Christ alone, but are they going to be there? And ultimately we know people that's, you know, maybe they, we don't know if they're saved or not, but maybe when they, when they trust in Christ alone as a young man or woman, we have no idea, but they will be there because God knows their heart because it is a heart condition here. They've erred in their heart and they have not known his ways. What are his ways? So we'll see what he says here. Verse 11. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Man, I love having a rest. The older I get, I like having peace. I like having a rest. I like being able not having a, a to-do list of 55 things to get done in a day. I like having a, a, a time in my life where I can actually have rest. And I want to have that enter into his rest. He says, take heed, brethren, lest there be any of you an evil heart of unbelief. Well, here it is. An evil heart of unbelief. In departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. So the reason people do not believe today is because they have been deceived by sin. They've been deceived by it. They find confidence in their wealth. They, they find confidence. They compare themselves to their neighbors. I'm a little bit better than the guys in the county jail. I'm better than the guys in prison. You know, maybe, you know, again, maybe they find confidence in their intelligence. But do not let someone rob you of your peace if you've trusted in, if you've trusted in Christ. Remember, individuals of trust in Christ alone are partakers of the heavenly calling. Verse 1. Partakers of Christ. We are in Christ, which is positional truth. 15. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in provocation. Let's not provoke the anger of the Lord. Harden not your hearts. Be not deceived of sin. Do not have that unbelief. For who, when they had heard, did provoke? Did not all that come out of Egypt by Moses? But with whom was he grieved forty years? What is it not with them that had sinned? Whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swore he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? So we see that they could not enter because of unbelief. Very interesting here. So you caught the nation Israel. They did not believe. And I wonder what people are thinking. What did they not believe? Did they not believe the Ten Commandments? Did they not, when Moses came down from Mount Zion and ultimately, or Mount Sinai, and he presented the Ten Commandments there, and Aaron had built a golden calf, what did they not believe? And I'm a true believer that this whole Bible, the Old Testament, they look to Christ, we look back to Christ. We have dispensations in the Bible. They are, they are conditions that God has given to man under certain times that man is to live by, but it's always been saved by faith. We know the first dispensation. God created man in innocence, and it's a proven fact in Genesis chapter 2, verse 16, 17, 18 there, that he gave man one condition. He created him in innocence. They didn't, 
no good or bad, and he gave him one job. Don't eat of the tree over here. You can have anything out here. You can do whatever you want, but you cannot have eat of that tree right there. And what did man do? They ate of it. Again, showing man's heart. Then ultimately he gave them the age of uh, uh, carnality, the age of conscience. And, uh, to, and in Genesis 3.15, he promised them a redeemer. And from that time, we know that in that age of uh, conscience there, the burnt offering was given. And they were in the garden there in chapter 3. They covered themselves with fig leaves. God says, no, he killed an innocent animal, covered them with, with a lamb skin, a skin, ultimately a picture of Christ. In chapter 4, starting the burnt offering, where Abel, ultimately Cain killed Abel. The burnt offering was right there, looking for the Messiah. Right then and there. So I wonder what this nation Israel, what did they not believe? And I thought about that. I'm like, man, what, what, what was the issue? Well, like with everything in the Bible, if you keep reading a little bit, always gives you the answer. You don't have to interpret anything. So you had a whole nation, 40 years wandering in the wilderness, never have rest. Why? Chapter 4, 1. Let us therefore fear lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest. Any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. I read that, I'm like, I reread that. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word, but the word preached did not profit them not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. <laughs> that is so good. They heard the gospel, but they did not mix it with faith. They're like, that sounds good, but I'll do it my way. Give me something that I can do. And ultimately, God gave them that. He gave them the Ten Commandments and ultimately another uh, the 613, but the Ten to show them that they couldn't do it. If you go back and read Exodus 19, 5, 1 through 4 there, they ultimately, that is what we'll do. And then in Exodus 20, he gave them the Ten Commandments. But yet they fell short all the time. But here, they heard the gospel, but they did not mix the hearing of the gospel with faith. They're like, what was their issue? Their issue was a hardened heart. They were deceived by sin. And ultimately, that was the problem heart of unbelief you have heard it and i hope all of you have mixed the hearing with faith according to your faith let it be to you according to your faith let it be to you when people get to heaven or ultimately in front of the white throne judgment and they're going to stand under the white throne judgment and they're going to be judged according to the works it'll be according to their faith and ultimately they'll be cast into hell and lake of fire for all eternity because then it will come down to your sins are paid for. It will come down according to your faith. Do you believe it or not? Where does your faith in? Because either your faith is in Christ or it's not. You will have faith not in Christ. I'll do it my way. Whatever that is, I'll trust in my rituals, my sacraments, my traditions, or my works. And I'm going to give you some verses here because let it be unto you. According to your faith, let it be unto you. Look at 2 Timothy 1.12. Great verses here. 2 Timothy 1.12. For with which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. I know who I am believed. I know who am I have believed. I know I believed in Christ Jesus, the Messiah, the Anointed One, who promised me to never go to hell if I trust in the finished redemptive work that I'll have eternal life, that I'm sealed with the Holy Spirit, guaranteeing inheritance into heaven. I know whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded that He's able to keep that which I have committed unto him that day by my faith. I committed him that he will deliver me when I die. That's a promise. And I'm going to hold him to that promise. That's where my faith is. Look at Romans chapter 4 verse 1. Romans 4 21. According to your faith, let it be. 4 21 says, And being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he is able to perform. Do you believe that he's able to save you from a hell that you deserve to have and you don't? All by faith in Christ? Are you persuaded? Ultimately, look at Matthew 9, 28 and 29. 
Matthew 9, 28 and 29. According to your faith, be it unto you. Verse 28, And when he was come into the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said unto them, Blind, that's us, before you're saved. Believe ye, and Jesus said unto them, Believe ye that I'm able to do this? Are you able that, are you able, do you believe that I'm able to save you? That I died for all of your sins at the cross of Calvary, even the ones that I've paid for all of them, that I died for you, was buried for you, I resurrected for you, and I give you this eternal life, and that you will never, ever go to hell, ever, again. You can't. Believe that I'm able to do this? They said unto him, yeah, Lord. And he, then he touched their eyes, saying, according to your faith, be it unto you. Jesus Christ said he paid for all of your sins. He died for all your trespasses against God. He gave up his life for all your iniquities. Carl and I one night were like, you know what, let's look up some of these words. What does iniquity mean? It means wickedness. He gave up his life for your iniquities, my wickedness, all our injustices, all our injustice acts towards God, not just people, but just towards him. Jesus Christ paid it for every sin debt that you have in full. He was buried for you. He resurrected for you, showing that God the Father accepted Christ's death payment for all your hurtful, harmful, sinful acts, all of them, even the ones that you've not committed. Jesus Christ promises eternal life when a person trusts, trusts in Christ alone for salvation. Jesus Christ promises a person that they will never go to hell when they trust in Christ alone. Jesus Christ promises that you will be you have an eternal inheritance when you trust in Christ alone. Jesus Christ promises absent from the body, present with the Lord when their last breath escapes this corruptible body. Jesus, Jesus Christ promises to save you from a hell you deserve to have and you don't. Are you persuaded that he's able to do this? If yes, lay hold and commit it to him. According to your faith, let it be. And I can find rest in that. I can find a cessation of ultimately of body and soul and just complete rest, like laying it on my grandpa's lap, laying in my Savior's arms. Be not like the Hebrews, or I'm sorry, the nation Israel there, and when they heard the gospel, they believed not. Have it mixed with faith. That's why we're to preach the word of God. Verse 3, for we who have believed. Again, us. Past tense, we have believed. Again, speaking to believers like partakers of the heavenly calling. What are we? We have entered into the rest all by faith in Christ. As he said, I have sworn in my wrath that they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Enter into the rest. A rest is a cessation of motion of body or being. There's a labor of rest and a mental rest. Religious performance-based systems will never give you rest. Confessional booth, communion, confirmation, water baptism, following commandments never give you rest. It's only Christ that gives you rest. It's only Christ that offers a cessation of body and being because he has done all the work. Do you know that he speaks? I love that he ultimately, Hebrews here was written after the resurrection, but Jesus Christ always speaks as things are to be done. Even in John chapter 17, there ultimately he talked about the work being done. And he went and had not one to the cross, but ultimately... That's what the gospel is. It was been eternal. But he talks about how things are. And I like that. And here we are. The works were finished from the foundation of the world. Because he knew he was going to go to that cross. And we have yet one more verse confirming. We know there in Timothy. We know in Peter. We know in John. We know in Ephesians. That the gospel was preordained. That man was going to sin. That Christ was going to be our sin bearer. He was going to become sin for us and resurrect for us. And I don't know why people don't get that or love that. Yet man will reject that and be like, yes, but you got to be good. Yes, you got to give money to the church. Yes, you got to. No. Christianity is not a change in behavior. Christianity is a change in heart. Are you going to trust in Christ or not? Do you see yourself as a hurtful, harmful sinner? You deserve to go to hell. 
And yet you'll trust in Christ, trust in Christ alone for salvation. You do that, you find rest. Man, there's nothing greater than that. If you turn over to Matthew chapter 11. Verse 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. I think it was in Acts 15 when Paul came back on his first mission trip. He met with up. There was a council in Jerusalem. All the Jews and the apostles were up there. And the Jews had a real problem at first with the Gentiles getting saved like they were saved by faith. And Peter gives, speaks up at this council and he tells the Jews, why would you lay a burden upon them that they are not able to carry? Why would you put a law that not even they themselves or their fathers could carry? And that is the burden of the law. You try to do this religious performance-based systems and you will fall short every single time. And I believe that's the number one contributor to atheism and free thinkers today. I think a lot of these atheists, like, no, this is, I don't have you know, any statistics to back this up, but I would bet the most atheists and most free thinkers today were, grew up in a per religious performance-based home. And of, over time, they've seen their mom and dad fall short. Over time, they've seen the, you know, this religious church violate or take abuse their power and violate mom and dad. And finally, they just got to the point and be like, there's no God. I can't do this. I truly believe that. That's what religion does. That's right, my thought. But here, the work for salvation, it's done. It has been done since the foundation. Turn back to Hebrews 4. Three there. It has been done since the foundation of the world. The gospel is everlasting. Same today as it is yesterday as it will be tomorrow. Truth is absolute. Truth is not relative. We have a huge movement across the nation today that wants to redefine truth. Truth does not change. It doesn't change uh, because of time and it doesn't change because of cultures or culture's values. Truth is is absolute truth today is the same yesterday as it will be tomorrow and jesus christ says i'm the way the truth and life and no man comes to the father except through me god speaks god speaks as if, as if things are and the work has been done before the foundation of the world was created because this is what he has done at the cross of calvary look at four for he spoke in a certain place on the seventh day in this day and god did rest the seventh day from all his works. God rested. If you turn over to Genesis chapter 2, it talks about God rested the seventh day, Sabbath. But we know the Sabbath wasn't made for God, it was made for us. And this is why I truly believe that Jesus Christ, when he died on the Passover, that was the Sabbath, a cessation of works. God works. There's just not one layer. It goes seven layers deep. And we see the Sabbath. And ultimately, when he died on the 14th there, or the first month of Nisan, the 15th, the second day, the Feast of Unleavened Bed, Unleavened Bread. Again, a Sabbath day, a cessation of works. And ultimately, the first fruits, the, the 16th day of the first month, the 14th, 15th, and 16th, three days, Jesus Christ died, was buried, and he resurrected. The third day, the first fruits, another feast day. Again, or another Sabbath a cessation of works, and ultimately Christ did all the works. There will be no excuse if you reject Jesus Christ as your Savior. It's over and over and over, the work has been done, and ultimately come to Him by faith and faith alone. And ultimately, we know that God rested. We know that Christ was resurrected, and He sits at the right hand of the Father today because the work is done. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest. 
Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter it, and they to whom it was first preached enter not in because of unbelief. They have a hardened heart. They deceive themselves because of sin. They're like, man, that sounds good, but not for me. They enter not into that rest because of unbelief. Again, he limited a certain day, saying to David, Today, after so long a time, as it is said today, if you hear his voice, harden not your hearts. If you turn over to Psalm 95, 7 through 11 there, you're going to see something. David actually spoke what the Hebrew writer did in chapter 3 there. Same words. So we know in context here exactly what Psalm 95 is talking about. Look at verse 7. For he is our God. We are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his land. Today, if you will hear his voice, hear the gospel. 8. Harden not your heart, as in the provocation, like the day of the, the nation Israel, when they wandered, they provoked the Lord to anger. In the day of the temptation of the wilderness, when their, your fathers tried me, tested me, and saw my work, they rejected it. Forty years long I was grieved with this generation and said, It is a people that err in their heart, and they have not known my way. And unto whom I swore my wrath, that they should not enter into my rest. In context here, we know that's related to the gospel. Verse 8. For if, my Bible says Joshua. You might say Jesus, but we know Joshua. He is a type of Christ. We know motion. We sang the song, that song, the last song that Jack picked there, standing on the promises, or it was, uh, I don't remember exactly what song it was. What, what page is that, Jack? Sweet Hour of Prayer. Yep. It says, till from Mount Pisgah's lofty heights, verse 4, the Lord took Moses up to Mount Pisgah, and he showed him the promised land. But we know Moses didn't even make it there. We know Moses, his... His sin was not that he didn't believe. We know Moses was a believer. But we know Moses, when ultimately when he struck the rock in Mount, at, with Mount, at Mount Horeb, he told that he was to strike the rock, a picture of Christ, and ultimately water come from the rock. Then he was told to speak to the rock, because you don't, you don't need to re-crucify Christ over and over and over. He already cried. So when you, and ultimately, he was told, was told to speak to the rock, and that's what we're doing. We have fellowship, but he went up to the rock. He was so angry that he strikes the rock again and again, and ultimately... His sin was different. We know Moses was saved. But again, a picture of God was pretty angry with Moses. Shouldn't have done that. But ultimately, showed him this promised land. And we know Joshua, two men. There was 12 individuals that God sent. Says, you know, sent 12 spies up. And 10 of them came back and they said, you know what? There's, these are giants in the land. We will never be able to defeat the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Parasites and the Jebusites. We cannot do this. And Joshua says, yes, we can. And Caleb says, yes, we can. And ultimately, the whole nation followed the ten lies and then these, these liars. But God says, you know what? That generation shall pass. But ultimately, Caleb and Joshua, and we know Joshua was a type of Christ, and Joshua led them to the promised land. However, Joshua's leading here was a temporary rest. Or Jesus gives us a permanent rest. Look at verse 9. Therefore remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased, like these ladies said here, from his own works. Stopping from your own labor, as God did from his. And ultimately, verse 11 there, it says, let us labor Therefore, to enter into the rest, lest any man fall after that same example of unbelief. And I say here, let us labor in the finished redemptive work of Christ. Let us labor in word, prayer, fellowship, which gives us full assurance. Let us know that Christ paid for all sin, past, present, future. Let us know that God made, had made some significant promises in John 3, 16. 
In John 3, 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believeth in him should not perish, but have an everlasting life. And I think a lot of times we skip over never perish. Whoever believes in Christ alone for salvation will not go to hell, will never, ever go to hell. Whoever believes in Christ alone for salvation will not only go not go to hell, but they have everlasting life. Why? Because Christ paid for all sin, paid for all sin. People do not go to hell because they're bad. People go to hell because ultimately are the ones who have put their faith in Christ alone. People who go to hell are the ones who have not put their faith in Christ alone for salvation. Because if you read John 3, 16 through 18, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believe in him should not perish. But have everlasting life, for God sent not his Son in the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believe on him is not condemned, but he that believe not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So we have this rest that's in the gospel, all by faith. And now we're going to go to. 12 through 16 there. Interesting verses. And this is what we talked about. I'm sure Brian's message last week was a lot about this. And this is as a child of God, what are we should we do? Not give our peace away. We can never give our rest away, but we can give some, you know, our be anxious and be distressful, but we have this eternal rest in Christ and we can never give that away because it's him that holds on to us. But we can still be anxious in this lifetime. Focusing on the temporal things and not the eternal things. So what are we to do? These verses here. Let's look read these and we'll talk a little bit about these. For the word of God is living. is powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. Of the joints and marrow. It is discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart. So one, God knows if you've trusted in Christ alone or not. He's the discerner of the heart. He knows if you have a complete rest in his work or not. If you are ceased from your labors. Neither is there any creature that in, is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is past into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our profession. Remember, he's the object of our faith. 15, for we have not an high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of infirmities, but was all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Everything that we've experienced, Christ experienced, but he did it without sin. 16, so as a child of God, here's what we're to do. Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And I wrote here, I says, in your distress, in your suffering, in your anxiousness, in your depression, go to the throne room of grace. Lay your prayer petitions down before God. It is God that gives you rest. However, there's no rest, ultimately, if you're not saved. There is no rest if you've not trusted in the gospel of Christ. There is a rest that God offers in Christ, an eternal rest, freely received in Christ alone. Once a person has trusted in Christ alone, knowing God will save you when you die because he paid for all of your sins, knowing you cannot go to hell, that is rest that only God can give. No matter what this life gives, no matter what trial, temptation, mass its ugly head at the, on the horizon, we need to know that these trials and temptations are temporary. Lay hold of the hope and confidence in Christ. Do not give your peace or rest away. And we'll, I'd like you to turn over to Psalm 4 and we'll close with Psalm 4. I've heard a couple of people talk about this. Lying in bed. Anxious in their before sleep, struggling with sleep because they did not know if they were good enough that day to get to heaven. This is prior to them being saved. Again, this is a 
the rest that we can find and have in Christ. Again, you can't give that rest away, that red eternal rest that he gives. But if you're laying in knife and laying at night in bed, and ultimately your bed becomes a sauna or a you know a hot tub of because of your sweat and anxiousness. And I've done these sweatful nights, stressed about temporal things, and ultimately soon they pass. But it just this Psalm 4 gave me some peace and it made me think about a couple individuals that when you lay your head down at night you can have that think about that eternal rest. You can hear verse 4 how this man, David, he entered to the throne room of grace. He says, Hear me when I call O God of my righteousness. He is the God of our righteousness, the righteousness received by faith in Christ. Thou hast enlarged me. You know, it is God that makes us bigger and gets us through these trials. It's not me that pump myself up, pump my mind up, that makes me larger than life to get me through these trials. It is God that makes me larger in life and delivers me through these, through these valleys that sometimes I think are going to crush me. Though ha- thou hast enlarged me when I was in distress. Have mercy upon me and hear my prayer. O ye sons of men, how long will you turn my glory into shame? How long will you love vanity and seek after falsehood? Salah. Salah is like a musical rest. It's a change in mood. So you can hear the melody change right here. But know that the Lord hath set apart him who is godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call unto him. And what a privilege that I can be on my motorbike. I can be in my car. I can be under a trailer. I can be anywhere. And when I call on him, he hears my voice. Stand in awe and sin not. Commune with your own heart. Because it is a heart condition. Upon your bed and be still. Salah. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness. Put your trust in the Lord. There are many that say, Who will show us any good? Lord, lift up the light of thy countenance upon us. Thou hast put gladness in my heart, more than in the time that their grain and their wine increased. And this is the verse that made me think of these two men. I will both lie down in peace and sleep. For thou, Lord, only makest me dwell in safety. Rest in my grandpa's arms. I can actually fall asleep with that. Let's close in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, again, Father, we just want to thank you for this amazing grace. We don't deserve it, but it's who you are. You're the God of grace. You're the God of mercy. You're the God of love. We know that your work has been finished before the foundation of the world was created. The gospel is eternal. And we know that we find rest when we trust in, believe that Christ died on the cross for our sins, was buried and resurrected for us. We have that eternal rest. That rest is given to us by belief in the work that Christ had done at the cross. And we're just thankful that we have this eternal rest. And Father, as your children of God here, we just gather in your name and sometimes we give that Sometimes that peace, we that temporal things of this world will sometimes try to steal it. We just pray, Father, that we would not give it away. That we keep our mind on the eternal things of God. And ultimately, we can have that every day. We can have that rest and peace that you give us as children of God. And just like Jack said the two weeks ago, that, you know, that we would unleash the power of the Word of God. Romans chapter 10 there. That individuals would hand out heaven tracts. Ultimately, that we would let other people know that they can change their eternal destiny, that all they have to do is put their faith in Christ alone, believe that Christ died on the cross for their sins, buried, resurrection. And ultimately, these people can also know that they have an eternal rest, a cessation of work, a labor and a mental rest that only God can provide. Man, that gives you peace. There's a safety in that. And Father, we're just so thankful for this pavilion today that we can come here and gather your word, hear your word, sing praises and songs to you. And like Brian said, Father, we just pray that you would provide a building for us. Thankful for faithful church believers here today that we gather and we continue to work together 
Each one of us has different gifts, and you put it on our heart as the Spirit works through us, whatever that gift is, but we labor together to furtherance the gospel of Christ. And through just this week, we know that 15, 20 people got saved. And what a privilege that you've given to us that we could be part of somebody's salvation. That's an amazing. We love being partners with that. And we thank you for entrusting us with the gospel of Christ. And Father, we just pray that you be with the people that are not here with us today. We know we've got some emails that some people are sick. We just pray that you be with them and you would deliver them through this sickness. And ultimately, they could... Even in their sickness, they could have some peace and rest. So we just pray that you would keep us all healthy, keep us all safe. And we just pray that you bring us all back next week where we continue to give glory to you. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Carl and I were talking and we were been talking about doing situational or, or more of uh, topical subjects like the power of the gospel, the gospel rest. Uh, so we'll probably continue and how we get it you know instead of just going through a book verse by verse maybe we'll continue to do with topical things and maybe somebody has a topic that they want to talk about you know or they would like to hear about you can email me and we can design a message on that if you have something or if you got a question you know maybe somebody has a question they would like more to talk about email me or share it now whatever you want but we'll sing our last song and uh, we'll Dismiss. Our last song is on page 27, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. And I hope that as Pastor Lance shared with us that God was speaking to your heart. He was speaking to mine. And I know sometimes I get quite busy with the mundane things of life, the things that don't count for eternity at all. And I have to pause and I go, I've been so busy. I have crowded God out of my life. And I find that I'm not in a place of spiritual or physical rest but i'm stirred within and so uh, our rest is as only as good as the foundation which it's built upon we know our foundation is built on christ so let's stand on that foundation and be mindful we do have a friend in jesus <laughs>